Today we will start with our third and last chapter on um, background information, which is on the Poincaré group or Poincaré invariants, relativistic invariants, and some consequences. In this section, uh, on the one hand, I have the purpose of um, repeating and reminding ourselves of some basic information which you are probably familiar with, like uh, the form of Lorentz transformations and translations, and to set up notation. But on the other hand, I want to derive a few very fundamental things which follow from Poincaré invariance or relativistic invariance and which will really set the scene for the rest of relativistic quantum field theory. And so the basic physics questions and also technical questions that we want to answer in the course of this chapter here are the following. First, we have seen that fields are maybe important tools and uh, efficient tools to describe multi-particle systems and maybe fields, quantum fields, field theories are necessary for relativistic quantum theories as well. So fields are important and then you can ask yourself what is the most general type of a field that you can have in a relativistic theory? And actually you can give an answer to this question. There is a full set of relativistic fields that you can list and we will uh, introduce that list and derive it and uh, understand where it comes from and then of course from that point on we have a toolbox which uh, has a, an exactly defined uh, set of ingredients and we can afterwards use those particular types of fields to build up relativistic field theories. Okay, fields are maybe tools, but what about physics? So we have maybe discussed that particles are more fundamental uh, observed objects in nature. So there are particles like hydrogen atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, photons, and so on. And you can again ask yourself the question, what is the most general type of particles in a relativistic theory? And so actually you can give some answers simply following from uh, requiring quantum mechanics postulates combined with relativity and this gives rise to a certain set of possible types of particles and we also want to identify that possible set of particles and of course every relativistic field theory afterwards uh, which will give rise to predictions of particles must follow that general outline and uh, so these are the two sets of consequences that we want to derive and uh, we will end with this tomorrow and uh, the consequences will determine the rest of the semester of course but you can already see even though we will not discuss it in great detail this week but you can already see that uh, the two results form the basis of some very interesting further consequences which will uh, guide us um, a lot in, in the next months Namely, the possible types of fields and the possible types of particles, uh, they conflict each other. So there is not a direct and simple one-to-one -one correspondence between the possible particle types and the possible types of fields, but there is some kind of a mismatch. And what is the impact of that mismatch? That mismatch is that uh, not all particles can behave in all possible ways that you might imagine at first sight but uh, their uh, interactions are restricted and on the level of fields uh, the fields cannot interact in all possible ways because otherwise they would conflict to the possible types of particles and uh, the technical outcome of what I'm alluding to is again gauge invariance. So in order to remove that mismatch between particle types and fields we need the concept of gauge invariance and that uh, sort of gives you already a hint that uh, actually the possible interactions of certain types of particles are restricted by gauge invariance. And so that is of course also what is observed in nature and which is implemented in the standard model of particle physics and also in quantum electrodynamics. So we see that uh, we are on track to derive some very fundamental and also deep consequences. But let's begin. Um, with uh, introducing Poincaré transformations. Okay. 
And uh, so the notation is that we have four vectors x mu, and if I write x mu with upper Lorentz index mu, mu runs from zero to uh, three, and um, if we want to uh, uh, denote explicitly the time component, then I would write x zero for the time component and x i um, with index i, j, k, and so on for uh, the spatial components. And the upper indices are the fundamental ones. So that is equal to the time coordinate. And uh, these spatial components with upper index i are the normal spatial components of an ordinary three vector. Then x mu with a lower index mu is obtained by contracting with the metric tensor. And the metric tensor g mu nu is a 4 by 4 matrix. It has the same elements regardless whether we have upper or lower indices. And it is this matrix with uh, only non-zero entries on the diagonal. And we have 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 on the diagonal. Then also for important four vectors are momentum four vectors where we have uh, again the time component and spatial components and here the time component is equal to the energy and the spatial components with upper indices are uh, the normal three vector for the three dimensional momentum. We also have derivative operators. Uh, where the more fundamental index would be the lower index, d sub mu, which is defined as the derivative, partial derivative, with respect to x mu, where in the derivative now the index is an upper index. So derivative with respect to x upper index mu is abbreviated as d sub mu, and so on. So and that would be the derivative with respect to time, and the spatial derivatives are the normal Nabla operator. So this is just some notation which uh, we should be familiar with. And now let us come to the actual symmetry, which uh, is relativistic symmetry, which is a symmetry of our space type. And uh, relativistic invariance contains, of course, Lorentz invariance, but not only that, even simpler, there are also translations which are important for us. And so we first have this uh, symmetry under x mu goes to x mu plus a constant for vector a mu. So these are translations. And uh, so the meaning is that a mu is a constant four vector and uh, x mu is our space time variable. And uh, so therefore you do a translation both in time and space. And uh, the laws of nature are invariant under such tra translations. And the other are Lorentz transformations where x mu is replaced by lambda mu nu times x nu, where lambda mu nu is a 4 by 4 matrix describing the corresponding Lorentz transformation. Where in general Lorentz transformations are defined by a property, namely scalar products are invariant, namely x mu uh, y mu um, goes in principle to x prime mu, y prime mu, but that is the same as the original scalar product. So this property is the defining property of all Lorentz transformations. All matrices which satisfy this for all x and y are called Lorentz transformation matrices. Now uh, we can define the Poincaré group Uh, which is the combination of all possible translations and Lorentz transformations. So the Poincaré group consists of uh, all combinations of the form lambda and A, which are a combined Lorentz transformation and translations. Uh, 
and uh, so there is a group law which I just write down for completeness. So if you have first do a translation and a Lorentz transformation with a matrix lambda bar and a bar and afterwards you do a second Lorentz transformation and translation, then they combine to the combined Lorentz transformation lambda times lambda bar matrix multiplication and for the translation something non-trivial happens because first you do a translation by a bar, then this undergoes the Lorentz transformation lambda and at the end you do a second translation with A. So translations and Lorentz transformations combine in this group multiplication law in this non-trivial way. And so the Poincaré group is really for us, for quantum field theory, the important group which summarizes all our space-time symmetry transformations and uh, uh, simply put, we can say a relativistic theory must be invariant under the Poincaré group. And therefore, of course, the mathematical study of the Poincaré group is quite important and influential. Let us now briefly come back to this requirement here. Let's call it star for the Lorentz transformations. And so any matrix lambda which satisfies this for all x and y is called the Lorentz transformation. Let's uh, rewrite this requirement in, in a more direct form such that you can easily uh, read off whether a matrix is a Lorentz transformation or not. So maybe let me do it on the blackboard. So we can, uh, instead of the scalar product, uh, let's write x times y, let's write it as x rho y sigma times metric tensor g rho sigma. Okay, so that is the same on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, let me write the scalar product x prime times y prime in a certain form. So first of all, x prime. What is x prime? x prime is lambda times x with some indices. Let's call them lambda mu rho times x rho. That is x prime with Lorentz index mu. And then we have y prime lambda times y. Let's say index lambda nu sigma times y sigma. That is y prime with index nu. And then let's contract it with g mu nu. Okay. So then we have x prime with index mu, y prime with index nu times g mu nu. That is exactly the scalar product between x prime and y prime and that is supposed to be the same as this scalar product here. And now if you require that this equation is valid for all x and y, then you can abstract from x and y. So you have here on the left hand side x rho and y sigma. On the right hand side you have also x rho and y sigma. The equation is valid for all x and y. That means the coefficients in front of the x rho and y sigma must be the same. So here the coefficient is that. And here the coefficient is this lambda times that lambda times that g mu. These combinations must be equal. So that means star is valid for all x and y uh, if and only if the following equation is valid, namely lambda mu rho times lambda nu sigma times g mu nu is equal to g rho sigma. This is then the defining condition for Lorentz transformations. And there are some immediate consequences of this relationship. So namely, first of all, we can derive something about the determinant of any Lorentz transformation matrix lambda. What is the determinant of any Lorentz transformation matrix lambda? You can take the determinant of both sides of the equation. This determinant is something, it's minus one. That is the same. So these determinants cancel. And then you have here determinant of lambda square. So it means the determinant of lambda square must be one. So the determinant of lambda itself 
can only be plus one or minus one, nothing else. So determinant of lambda is either plus one or minus one. And that also means something about such integral volume elements. If you have an integral volume element like d4x, and you would do a Lorentz transformation on your variables, then you see that because that determinant lambda absolute value is one, something like this is Lorentz invariant. So therefore we know immediately uh, how we can write down Lorentz invariant integrals, because here we have a Lorentz invariant integral measure. So this is an important property of Lorentz transformations. Now, the next step is to go from uh, finite Lorentz transformations and translations to infinitesimal ones. Because you already know from quantum mechanics that it's often sufficient and very instructive to look only at infinitesimal transformations which deviate from the unit transformation only by a small amount. And uh, it's mathematically easier and for physics often even um, better and uh, gives a clearer picture of what is going on in physics. Okay, so what happens if we have here infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. So we would then write, so this is a standard notation which we will always use, lambda mu nu is given by the unit matrix, Kronecker delta mu nu with these upper and lower indices, plus something small, which we call omega mu nu omega mu nu again with upper and lower indices. And that is now an infinitesimal matrix. Then the question is, how uh, does this defining condition for Lorentz transformations translate into a condition for the lambda mu nu matrix? So then star is equivalent at first order in omega. To the following, namely, let's not derive it. Omega mu nu is equal to minus omega nu mu. So this infinitesimal matrix must simply be antisymmetric. You can plug in the definitions and uh, then read off from the first order term in omega that this must be true. And so that shows you the possibilities for infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. Namely, uh, all possible omega matrices which are, are anti-symmetric form, the, uh, let's say, the basis of some direction of Lorentz transformations. And uh, so now you can ask yourself how many uh, independent possible omegas are there? That gives you the answer to uh, how many possibilities do you have to do Lorentz transformations? How many different types of Lorentz transformations are there? Okay, how many linearly independent anti-symmetric 4x4 matrices are there? Six. There are six anti-symmetric 4x4 matrices and uh, therefore there are six possibilities to do infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. What is the physical meaning of these six different types of Lorentz transformations? Three boosts, yes, but three not translations. Translations are not Lorentz transformations. Rotations. Three rotations and three kinds of boosts in x, y, and z direction. And uh, so that gives you the physical picture of these different omegas. So the Lorentz group is a six parameter Lie group and uh, that corresponds to three rotations and three boosts. And the Poincaré group is 
also a Lie group with 10 parameters. Namely, in addition to the rotations and boosts, you also have four translations. A Lie group is simply a group where all group elements can be regarded as continuous functions of some parameters. And this is the case here. This is what that means. There are first of all infinitesimal group elements because this continuous function uh, can be continued to the identity and then you can take first order derivatives. And uh, then you see here you have six parameters to parameterize rotations and boosts. And in addition, you have four parameters to parameterize translations. And so you have a 10 parameter uh, continuous group. That is the structure of the Poincare group. Okay, so now we have obtained our first few results. And now we can go to the next step, which uh, goes towards physics applications. Let's check this. which are representations. What is a representation of a group? In this particular case, we immediately write it down for the Poincaré group. A representation is a mapping where each group element is mapped to some linear operator or to some matrix. So we have this kind of mapping where lambda a is mapped to some linear operator. Or in the simplest case, matrices, which are finite dimensional linear operators, of course. Uh, and we call them here u of lambda comma a. So this u of lambda comma a is um, the output of that mapping and uh, the result is then a matrix or some linear operator. It could be an operator defined on a quantum Hilbert space. It could be a two by two matrix, four by four matrix. Um, many possibilities, but any such mapping uh, okay, not any such mapping, but uh, we first have such a mapping. Uh, this is then defined on some vector space. And uh, so not every such mapping is a representation, but we need to um, be compatible with the group properties with the following uh, law, namely if we have u of lambda comma a and then u of lambda bar comma a bar, um, you apply um, first the corresponding linear operator for this Poincaré transformation, then the one for that Poincaré transformation. And the result should be the same as if you apply the u for the combined Poincaré transformation. And the combined Poincaré transformation is this combination of Lorentz transformations and uh, that combination of translations. So if this law holds for any lambda and a and a bar and lambda bar, then the mapping here of Poincaré to operators is compatible with the group law. And something like this is called a representation. So that is a representation of the Poincaré group. And you can use representations everywhere in physics in particular. Representations typically tell you how some physical quantities transform under Lorentz transformations. So you might want to know how quantum states transform. You might want to know how some field transforms or some other physical quantity transforms. And uh, often uh, the physical quantities are defined on some vector space. And then your transformation law defines some representation where the Poincaré transformation in abstract terms is uh, represented by some operation on the appropriate vector space of those physical quantities. And uh, so we have here defined infinitesimal 
Poincaré and Lorentz transformation, so we can also do that for the representations, and that is important. So let's do it infinitesimally. Then we have u of such an infinitesimal transformation, which is uh, here shorthand delta plus omega. This uh, representation is what I mean here. So Kronecker delta is the unit matrix plus an infinitesimal matrix omega plus epsilon, which would be an infinitesimal transformation. So then, what is the uh, linear operator which is mapped to this infinitesimal transformation? So uh, the mapping must be continuous since the group is also continuous and differentiable. So we can basically expand in first order of uh, omega and epsilon this mapping here. And uh, at zeroth order, uh, if we just have the identity Poincaré transformation, of course our mapping must give the unit operator. And then we have a first order term in epsilon and omega. And so we have a first order term in epsilon, epsilon mu, and it has some coefficient. And we give a name to the coefficient, and the name of the coefficient is by definition i times p mu. So this i times p mu is just the Taylor coefficient of epsilon in a Taylor expansion of that mapping. Similarly, we have some linear term in omega. Let's call it omega rho sigma. And the coefficient of that would be minus i over 2 times omega rho sigma times some operator j rho sigma. That is just our name for the Taylor coefficient of omega in this expansion. And omega rho sigma is anti-symmetric, therefore also this j rho sigma is anti-symmetric as well. So there are four operators p mu defined in this way, and six operators j rho sigma defined in this way by the Taylor expansion of this mapping here. So these here, they are of course linear operators or matrices defined on the same vector space as the representation. And so for any representation of the Poincaré group, you in this way automatically have a definition of some operators p mu and j rho sigma. And they have an important physical meaning. Uh, in this way, we have defined p mu and j rho sigma, and so these are uh, called generators of the representation of the Poincaré group. So uh, we have in total 10 such generators of the Poincaré group representation. And so let us just write down the list p mu, and these would be by definition the four momentum operator and j rho sigma, which is equal to minus j sigma rho, which correspond to angular momentum and boosts. So in particular, to highlight the connection to angular momentum, let us give different names, namely Jx, which would be angular momentum in x direction, is identified with J23. Uh, Jy is identified with J31. Jz is identified with J12. So these would be uh, the normal angular momentum operators. So the next step is um, to obtain commutation relations. We have here now operators on some vector space. Doesn't yet have to be quantum mechanics, but is completely general still. Um, but we have operators 
and uh, they correspond to Poincaré transformations which have a certain group multiplication law. And because of that particular group multiplication law, those representation uh, generators satisfy certain commutation relations which are always the same uh, for any representation that you can uh, invent. And so we should uh, know about these possible commutation relations. Uh, we have to determine them once and for all. We can use one representation and then we know that for any other representation the um, commutation relation will be the same. So how can we most easily determine the commutation relations? One easy way is to define a simple representation uh, obtain those operators for that particularly simple representation and then simply compute the commutation relations. And the simplest representation that uh, I think uh, always exists is a representation in terms of differential operators where they are represented by derivatives d mu and so on which is familiar to us from quantum mechanics. And so let us set up a representation of the Poincaré group in terms of, um, first of all, uh, on a space of functions where derivative operators will be defined and then those generators here will be differential operators. So let us give a sample representation by uh, differential operators on some function space. <coughs> and so one representation on a space of functions is, let's say, let's not uh, write down too many mathematical symbols. So we now fix some space of functions, for example, square integrable functions, uh, defined on Minkowski space and so this is one element of that space of square integrable functions and we map it to another function f prime and the mapping is called uh, u of lambda a acting on f. So this operation is a mapping on the space of functions and the notation means that this function is mapped by this mapping to a new function f prime defined on the same space of functions. And now you need to say how in detail is this f prime function defined and in order to define it we need to go to the actual uh, function behavior with arguments and uh, it's defined such that uh, the new function f prime at the argument lambda x plus a has the same value as the original function at the argument x. Okay. So this is a mapping, right? By this relationship I define for any function f, I define a new function f prime. And they are related in this very simple way. That defines a mapping on a space of functions. And I claim that this mapping is a representation. It is a representation. And you should, should check it as the exercise. So this is on your exercise sheet. Check it yourself. You need to think a little bit carefully and uh, the exercise is deliberately made in a way uh, that you can also fool yourself because you might easily invent some other laws which are written on the exercise sheet which are no representation. And so this teaches you uh, why that is a representation and uh, other definitions might not be. Okay, but that is a representation. And let's just um, assume that you have done the exercise and we are sure that this defines a representation. And uh, then we can take this uh, linearized form of this operator u of lambda and a and uh, read off the values of those operators p and j. So that first of all is a representation. And uh, the operators are the following. So if you linearize it, then you get p mu here is i times d mu. The momentum operator p mu is just i times the derivative d mu. And 
to the operator j rho sigma that you can read off from the representation is given by i times x rho d sigma minus x sigma d rho. This uh, might remind you of angular momentum and ordinary momentum in quantum mechanics. So, and we will do this completely with all details in the exercise, or you have to do it yourself. And uh, then we discuss it in the exercise. But so for this simple representation, we have a first um, uh, example definition of these operators. And then, of course, you can uh, derive commutational relations between all those operators. And the commutators that you derive are valid in all representations, not only in this one. And uh, let's just write down what they are. First, the commutator between p mu and p nu. That is probably easy to read off for everybody. What is the commutator between p mu and p nu if that is your p? then the commutator is of course zero. So two different momenta commute. What about the commutator of p mu and j rho sigma? Is that zero as well? If you have this j rho sigma and this p mu, is the commutator, does it vanish or not? So the formulas are basically the same as the formulas that you know from quantum mechanics for the ordinary momentum operator in position space representation, right, where you have minus i nabla, it's the momentum operator in position space. And this is a generalization of the angular momentum operator in position space. So these formulas are really like in quantum mechanics. And in ordinary quantum mechanics, what would have been the commutator of p mu or p momentum and angular momentum? Is that commutator zero or not? It's not. Because this derivative here can act on the axis here. And uh, then it gives a non-zero contribution to the commutator. So you see in particular, if uh, the index mu is different from rho and sigma, then you have here a derivative with respect to some component which does not appear here. Then the commutator would be zero. However, if the index mu is equal to rho or sigma, then you get some non-vanishing commutator here. And so that explains why in the formula there appears a metric tensor between mu and rho and between mu and sigma. So the formula is the following. I times g mu rho times p sigma minus g mu sigma p rho. And uh, of course the right hand side is correctly anti-symmetric in rho and sigma as it has to be because the left hand side is also anti-symmetric. And then the last formula, j mu rho with j rho sigma, that has four indices and it's a generalization of the angular momentum commutation relations because that generalizes angular momentum. And for example, the two, three, three, one, one, two components, they are really angular momentum. So they should also behave like angular momentum. And uh, so this is of course a generalization. For sure the right hand side is not zero because the derivatives can act on all these axes. And the formula is as follows. It has four terms because of the anti-symmetry in mu nu and rho sigma. And let me immediately uh, show you how I would remember this formula. So you know, you know that the right hand side must be a generalization of angular momentum and it's anti-symmetric in all the indices. And so I plug in some example. Let's do an example. For example, J12 commutator with J23. 
Then I have here the commutator between Jz and Jx must give i times Jy, which is J31. Okay, so the commutator between this and that must give this result. And the formula that I'm going to write down must be compatible with this. And so I start mu nu 1, 2, 2, 3. So I get a metric tensor G nu rho times J mu sigma. Okay, let's check it. This uh, new row, G new row, is G22 is minus 1. This would now be minus 1 for the example. And that is J13. Uh, that is the negative of J31. So therefore, this term reproduces exactly that result. This is how I memorize the formula, and now I only need to completely anti-symmetrize the result, so I do minus the same thing with mu and nu replaced, g mu rho j nu sigma, then plus with rho and sigma exchanged, mu sigma j nu rho, and then minus again with mu nu replaced, g nu sigma j mu rho. And then I know the result reproduces what it needs to reproduce, and it's completely anti-symmetric in the index pairs as it should be. And then uh, I have the correct formula. And of course, you can check it directly by plugging in the differential operator expressions. Then just a final remark on the Poincaré representations, and I think I will squeeze it here, which is on Casimir operators. And I will just write the results without proof, and you can go to the literature uh, to look up some proofs. There are two operators which commute with all generators. And those two operators are, first of all, the operator P square, which is P mu, P mu contracted. So this is a Lorentz invariant operator, and one can show that this combination here commutes with everything. It commutes, of course, with all p's. That is obvious, but it also commutes with j rho sigma. And the interpretation is, of course, rest mass squared. This operator corresponds to the rest mass squared. And the fact that it commutes with all Poincaré generators means that the rest mass square or the eigenvalues of that operator are completely independent of the reference frame. So it's a completely Lorentz and translationally invariant um, physical quantity that we define here by this operator. And uh, of course you know uh, by experience that the rest mass of particles is an important um, property of particles and you know that it's Lorentz invariant. But actually there is one additional such operator, a second Casimir operator, and that is the following. It is called W square, which is W mu, W mu contracted, and that corresponds to something like spin. But I write it in quotation marks, and uh, we will have to investigate what it really means in more detail later on. That is part of our discussion, but the definition of this operator is W mu with lower index is defined as one half times epsilon mu nu rho sigma times P nu times J rho sigma, where I use here the convention epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3 is equal to plus 1, and the epsilon tensor is completely anti-symmetric in all the indices. Okay, so I do not want to show that those operators are Casimir operators or the only two Casimir operators, but let's just use that result from the literature. But we will come back 
to this uh, second operator because it uh, gives us some important insights and we will do that probably tomorrow. Okay, any questions so far? Let me clean this. As I said in the beginning, one new element that I want to discuss with you here is the question, what are the possible types of fields at all in a relativistic theory? And we are now starting to tackle this question. First, we will define what we mean by covariant and relativistic fields, and then we discuss the general uh, answer to the question. So that is 133, relativistic covariant fields. And let me first um, remind you of some very, very simple physical quantities. For example, you have, uh, as we already had a moment ago, a rest mass square of some particle. What is the property of a rest mass square of some particle? It is relativistically invariant. So if you measure it from any reference frame, you will always get the same answer. So this is invariant. So if you do a Lorentz transformation, let's only do Lorentz in this section, no translation. If you do a Lorentz transformation, it remains whatever it was before. And so this is invariant. And such quantities have a name. All physical quantities which have this behavior are called scalar quantities. So this is a scalar or a Lorentz invariant quantity. Then there are other types of quantities, for example, a four momentum, a four momentum of some particle, for example, P mu. Um, it is not Lorentz invariant. If you look at it from different reference frames, you measure different energies, different uh, spatial momenta, depend, you, you can do rotations, boosts, and so on. But you know what you get after a Lorentz transformation, namely, you get a new P prime mu, which is given by lambda mu nu times P nu. That is the behavior of a momentum four vector. And so all such quantities which have this behavior also have a name, namely they are four vector quantities or simply vector quantities. A vector is a physical quantity which behaves like this. And you could discuss other types of quantities, but we will not uh, proceed with this list. You could define spin or quantities, tensor quantities, and so on. But uh, this just uh, should give you some mindset. You can discuss different types of quantities. And now let us go to fields. A field is, of course, a physical quantity which is defined for all x, which is a function of uh, the space-time coordinates x. So we have here a coordinate system, and everywhere in this coordinate system, the field is defined, and it has certain values uh, for every x. For example, we can look at one point here, this point, and we might have a field which has a certain value at this point. And then we can ask uh, what happens in a different reference frame, in a different reference frame, maybe you transform this point to another point. And after the transformation, you get uh, not only transformed space-time points, but you also get transformed fields. And you might ask yourself, what is the value of the transformed field uh, at some space-time points compared to the value of the old field uh, at the old space-time points. And so the simplest type of transformation behavior is this one, where you start out with a field value at this point, then you do a transformation, the point goes here, and the new field at this point has exactly the same value as the old field at that point. So that would be a certain transformation law. And so, for example, we have here f of x, and afterwards, we have a new field, f prime, which is a new function defined on space-time. Uh, and we look at this new field at the transformed point x prime. And a simple behavior might be 
f prime of x prime is equal to f of x. And such fields exist and they have a name because they are behaving very similarly to the scalar quantities. Those are scalar fields. So let's define that. A scalar field is a field phi defined on space-time with the following transformation property. Under Lorentz transformations, phi goes to a new field, phi prime, with the property that phi prime at the transformed point lambda x. And we can, okay, now also do a Poincaré transformation, lambda x plus a is equal to the original phi at x. A field with this behavior is called a scalar field. Uh, are all fields scalar fields? No. Fields can have different uh, and more complicated behaviors. For example, you already know um, from the electric field and magnetic field, those fields are like vectors. So they have not only a value, they have a direction. They are three vectors in um, the ordinary treatment, but they can also be described by four vector uh, potentials. Anyway, you might uh, have fields with have, which have not only a value, but let's say a direction. So we might indicate this by such an arrow here. Then the field at this point is described by the vector here, denoted like this. And then you can again do a Lorentz transformation then this point goes here, and maybe the arrow is also transformed somehow, so the arrow might go to this arrow. And you can ask yourself, the transformed field F prime uh, is now again a vector in this space. How is its value related to the original vector at the original point? And uh, you can invent a law, and that law defines vector fields which are generalizations of those four vectors, so four vector field, which would be a field, let's call it A mu, which has the following property, A mu, under a Lorentz transformation or Poincaré, lambda and A, goes to a new field, A prime, with indices mu, with the following relationship, namely A prime mu, of lambda x plus a is equal to not the old a mu, but it's equal to lambda mu nu, a Lorentz transformation matrix times a nu at the old point x. That would be a four vector field, right? So the space time point is transformed and at a new point, the new field is the matrix transformation of the old field at the old point. And you discover here that uh, the scalar field is actually identical to what I wrote on the previous blackboard where I called uh, just a function f of x, which defined our simplest possible representation of the Poincaré group, and where your exercise is actually to check that that really is a representation because that is a non-trivial statement. And likewise, so what I write here defines a representation of uh, the Poincaré group and that also defines a representation of the Poincaré group and checking that this is a representation would be a non-trivial thing. Okay, so maybe a two-line uh, proof is necessary. Um, but this is a representation and it defines um, a representation of the Poincaré group on a space of functions. And so uh, these are scalar fields, vector fields, and there could be other types of fields because for any physical quantity with some transformation law like scalar, four vector, or spin, or a tensor, you could have the appropriate kind of field. And so let us now immediately jump to the completely general definition. And the completely general definition reads as follows. Now we define here a relativistic covariant field. This is a classical field. Uh, let's call it Psi with some index A of X. 
some index. Okay, so in the case of the vector field, this was a Lorentz index. In the case of a spinor field, it would be a spinor index. In the case of a tensor field, this would be a two Lorentz indices maybe, and so on. But it's just some generalized index. So the classical field might have some number of components. And it has a transformation law, namely psi a, and I do it here only for Lorentz transformations, psi a under Lorentz goes to some new field, psi prime, again with components and index a, where we have a certain law, namely psi a at the transformed point lambda x is equal to some matrix B A B, which depends on lambda times the old field with index B psi B at the old point x. Okay. So the transformed, sorry, psi prime, the transformed field at the transformed point is related to the old field at the old point by a matrix. That is the direct generalization of this. Except that here we have a specific matrix, namely Lorentz transformation matrix, and here we have a general matrix DAB with some index structure AB. And that matrix depends on the Lorentz transformation that we have chosen. Now, what kind of matrices are allowed here? What is allowed here are specific matrices which again preserve the group property. So this matrix here must also be a representation. It must be a representation of Lorentz transformations. So with a finite dimensional representation, D A B of lambda of the Lorentz group. And so all of this together defines a classically a classical relativistic covariant field. And it contains the vector field, the scalar field from before, but also all other types of relativistic fields. And this assignment defines a representation of the Poincaré group, uh, okay, uh, or Lorentz group, a representation of the Lorentz group on a space of functions. So the function space is an infinite dimensional vector space, right? Function space is a vector space with infinitely many dimensions. So therefore we have defined here a representation of the Lorentz group on some infinite dimensional space. And in order to define it, we have made use of some finite dimensional representation and uh, also the transformation of space time. So this defines an infinite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group on some space of functions. So it's not so important at this point to distinguish between Lorentz and Poincaré, so I wrote down only the one for Lorentz transformations. Okay. This is the general definition, and uh, you have two examples. You can imagine a few other examples too. And now the question is, as I asked in the beginning, what is the most general classical covariant field? How can we answer this? We know that uh, every classical covariant field must involve a finite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group as one building block. And therefore the question really is, what is the possible set of all finite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group? Okay. That is the question. And this is of course a mathematical question that mathematicians or theoretical physicists can answer. We just need to study the full representation theory of the Lorentz group and then determine the most general finite dimensional representation and then we know all possible types of relativistic covariant fields. And so let us find the answer to this uh, finite dimensional Lorentz representation theory. So 
types of relativistic covariant fields. So, and it's actually very simple because we can trace back the question to uh, something else where we know the answer already. And uh, so let's do it, but let me write down the question. What is the most general finite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group? And in order to answer it, we apply a trick, namely we uh, rearrange our generators of the Lorentz group in a clever way. Of course, you need to think a little bit until you get this idea, but uh, we take the idea from uh, the literature, of course, and so we define the following. We define a new operator A1 in the following way. A1 is defined as one half j23 plus i times j01. Okay, so you see here one, two, three, zero, one, this index structure. So we form a linear combination of a rotation and a boost. What is the physics? That is a rotation around the z axis, right? That is a uh, sorry, about the x-axis, of course, and that is a boost in x-direction. So we combine rotation and boosts uh, for some axis uh, with this sort of complex combination, and uh, this defines an operator A1. And so it goes on. We define A2 in uh, the similar way. A2 would be 1 half J31 plus I times J02, and so on. A3 accordingly. So we get three operators, A1, A2, A3. And uh, there is a second set, B1, defined in the same way but with minus. Okay, so it's obvious how it goes on. A1 and A2, they are just basically like complex conjugates of each other. And so knowing A123 and B123 is equivalent to knowing all the boosts and rotations. Okay, therefore, the study of uh, boosts and rotations uh, can be replaced by a study of A and B. That is the first insight. And so, okay, you can do arbitrary uh, linear combinations that you want. You can invent your own linear combinations, but this one is particularly clever. And uh, let us see why that is so clever. Because if you now uh, look at the commutation relations of the A's and B's, you discover, first of all, that uh, A1 commutator with A2 is equal to I times A3 and cyclic. So that means the A's satisfy uh, which commutation relation that you are very familiar with. This is the angular momentum commutation relation, right? So nothing could be more beloved than the angular momentum commutation relation. And the same is true for the B's. B1, comma, B2 is I times B3 and cyclic. So also the B's uh, are like angular momentum operators. Now that by itself is maybe not so great because, of course, anyway, we already had in our generators, we had the rotations, they also satisfy uh, the same angular momentum commutation relation. So what's the big deal in defining A and B, which again satisfy this commutation relation? The point is uh, that the A's and B's, they commute. So now A, I and B, J, this commutator is zero for all i and j. So the a's and b's are completely independent of each other. And that means that in this way we have split the Lorentz group or the Lorentz algebra of these generators into two completely separated sub-algebras. One three-dimensional sub-algebra of the a's 
and one three-dimensional subalgebra of the Bs, and they, these two commute with each other. So we can study completely independently the complete representation theory for the As and the complete representation theory for the Bs, combine them, and then we have the completely general representation theory for the full Lorentz group. Question? No. Oh. Okay, so uh, therefore the full Lorentz group is completely uh, traced back to uh, doing twice the angular momentum representation theory. And of course uh, the commutation relation for the A's and for the B's they are the same. Therefore the result for the A's alone and for the B's alone is the same and each of these results is the one that you already know from quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics you have studied the most general representation of angular momentum commutation relations, and this is exactly this commutation relation. So there is no additional ingredient in your quantum mechanics discussion, so your quantum mechanics discussion can be completely applied to this case. These operators satisfy the identical rules, and therefore the result from quantum mechanics is the result also here. We therefore already know the general representation theory for the A's and for the B's and therefore for the full Lorentz group. So each is the normal angular momentum algebra. And so we can say uh, more mathematically the Lorentz group is locally isomorphic to uh, basically the square of the angular momentum um, groups and that is the group SU2 cross SU2, so two independent SU2 groups. And therefore the representation theory from quantum mechanics and the angular momentum discussion. Therefore, let us write down the result, and the result is just copied from quantum mechanics. So SU2, or the angular momentum um, group, the rotation group has the following finite dimensional representations. Namely, the representation is on vector spaces of states, which are labeled by two quantum numbers, J and M, where J is either integer or half integer. So you have to choose one j out of uh, this list of possibilities. And uh, each j defines an irreducible representation. And the basis of such a representation consists of all the Jm with m going from minus j to plus j, j minus 1, j. So the m's uh, are, uh, um, let's say, going from plus minus j in steps of 1, in steps of unity. So the S uh, space of states for one specific j has how many dimensions? It has 2j plus 1 um, linearly independent basis states, so it's a 2j plus 1 dimensional representation. So that is the result from quantum mechanics and uh, 
Now we can apply this to our Lorentz group. Our Lorentz group simply is isomorphic to two such SU2 groups and each representation um, is given by this. And so therefore, all finite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group are now labeled by two such J's. We can choose a J representation for the A's and the second J representation for the B's. And once we have chosen two different or two values for the J's representing the A and B, then we have uniquely or unambiguously defined a representation for the Lorentz group. And that gives us all finite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group. So let's fit that here. All irreducible finite dimensional representations of the Lorentz group are characterized by specifying two j's, j1 and j2, j1 for the a's and j2 for the b's. Each of them can be integer or half integer. They can be equal or they can be different, doesn't matter. And this uh, choice of the two j's defines a representation which has how many dimensions, product of the two, namely uh, this is 2 times j1 plus 1 times 2 j2 plus 1 dimensional. Okay, so this is a very important and fundamental result. We have now understood all possible Lorentz representations and we could uh, list a few examples. Let us list a few examples. Let me just... So some examples. So the simplest choice is obviously the one where j is zero. So the simplest choice would be the zero comma zero representation. What is the zero comma zero representation? It is the one where um, uh, all uh, angular momentum operators jx, jy, jz in, for j equals zero, they map some state to zero. There are only zero eigenvalues of all the angular momentum operator if j is zero, right? So that is equivalent to saying the operators themselves are zero. So that here means now a and b are completely zero. If all the a's and b's are zero, what is the impact of a Lorentz transformation? So these are the generators of infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. If the operators are zero, it means uh, the infinitesimal Lorentz transformation is zero. That means everything is Lorentz invariant. So this representation defines the representation where everything is invariant to the trivial representation, which is, for example, the one for scalars, like m square. So this is the trivial representation. Everything is invariant and uh, that physically corresponds to scalars. So I stress uh, the trivial representation is very important because it corresponds to physical proper uh, objects being invariant, which is of course uh, a thing which uh, is not unimportant, but on the contrary, which is very important. So this representation, zero, zero, corresponds to the scalar representation. Then uh, there is the one half comma zero plus the zero comma one half representation. Uh, 
how many dimensions does this representation have? So uh, this here has two dimensions. So uh, j is one half. That means m can be plus minus one half. So it's a two-dimensional representation. This is also a two-dimensional representation. So overall, it's a four-dimensional <coughs> representation. And uh, what could this correspond to? So this uh, is like angular momentum one half. Uh, so and this uh, direct sum of vector spaces means that you have the first two dimensions here in, in your object, then the other two dimensions here below. So that means here angular momentum eigenvalues are plus minus one half for these two components. That means for those two components you also get eigenvalues plus minus one half. So overall this gives you eigenvalues of angular momenta of plus minus one half. So this defines something with spin one half. And uh, that is actually Dirac spinos. So these describe particles with spin one half, but uh, first of all, what we define by this representation are really the transformation properties of Dirac spinos. Some of you attended quantum mechanics with me. There we uh, defined a certain Lorentz transformation for Dirac spinos, and that directly corresponds to assigning A's and B's in exactly this way. There exists also uh, this representation, one half comma one half, that is not the same as this, because here it would be um, like a matrix product of vectors. So uh, one basis vector would be the vector where you have, uh, let's say, two particles with spin one half each. So you have a state, two particles here spin one half and here also spin one half. So in combination, the total state has not spin one half, but spin one or spin zero. So this representation corresponds to spin one or spin zero, in particular also to spin one. And uh, the objects which are defined by this are actually four vectors. So this representation, even though you see here one half appearing, it doesn't correspond to spin one half, but this is really uh, in that language, exactly the transformation of ordinary four vectors like p mu and x mu. That is really this representation. And so it goes on. Yeah, you can investigate now for all j's uh, the meaning of all these different representations. And this is, of course, only an outlook. I have not derived it here. This is just an outlook. And we will, in our quantum field theory um, discussion here in the next months and weeks, go through quantum fields with all those different representation properties and then we have plenty of time to determine the physical meaning of all those different representations and the different spins. Okay, so this gives us one answer to uh, this question, what are the possible types of relativistic fields? Here you have the answer. We have now the complete classification, the complete list of all possibilities um, determined. But now, uh, in the last five minutes, I would go to uh, the next topic, which is Lorentz transformations for particles. And what are the consequences of Poincaré invariance for particles, and uh, in particular also for quantum theories. So particles exist as states in a certain quantum theory. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to say uh, quantum theory is relativistically invariant and what can we then learn on particles? And so let's begin with this. This is a discussion of relativistic uh, quantum theory. And one particle states. So we will define a certain type of quantum states which correspond to single particles. These are these one particle states and they have then certain Lorentz uh, properties. 
So the first thing that we need to say in a relativistic quantum theory is a quantum theory is based on a Hilbert space of physical states. And if we want to have Poincaré invariance, we first must define what it means to say we have a Lorentz transformation. So that in particular means for every quantum state in our theory, we must be able to say what is its Lorentz transformed version. We must define something how to transform quantum states between reference frames. And that means we need a representation of our Poincaré transformations representation u of lambda comma a, a representation of Poincaré transformation on our Hilbert space of states. Okay. So that means we must be able to define for any state i, we must define a, a new state I prime, which is obtained by performing a Poincaré transformation with lambda a, and uh, this is defined by this representation lambda of a uh, acting on I. So this means, first of all, that our Poincaré transformations are linear, so they are represented by linear operators. That means if you have a linear combination of states, the uh, Lorentz transformed version is again the linear combination of the transformed states because we have here a linear operator acting on our Hilbert space of states. So the, let's say linear combination property of quantum mechanics is preserved under Poincaré transformations because we represent it by a linear operator. And then of course the group property uh, of um, two different Poincaré transformations back to back are preserved because of the representation property of this U of lambda A. So now we know how each quantum state transforms and we can obtain transformed states. But that is not yet invariant of under Poincaré. Now we need to say what does it mean that the theory is invariant and uh, in particular, the physics predictions of the quantum theory should be invariant under such Poincaré transformations. And the very, very most basic predictions of any quantum theory are always scalar products, which are probability amplitude whose square gives you probability. So the most basic objects in a quantum theory are scalar products. And so when we say we need invariance, uh, of all predictions, then the most fundamental invariance would be the one of any scalar product between two states, f and i. So this scalar product under lambda a should on the one hand go to f prime i prime, but it should be the same as the original scalar product. If this property holds for all states in the theory, then for sure the physics predictions are Poincaré invariant. Now, this relationship implies something about our representation u of lambda a. Namely, what does it imply? If we have here the transformed states, we can plug in the definition. So i prime is u acting on i. f prime is also u acting on f. So if we plug it here, we have to dagger it. So here we get f and i, and in between we have u dagger times u, the product of the two operators u dagger and u. So if this should be the same as the original scalar product, it means that the combination u dagger u must be the identity operator. That is our condition. So this means um, u dagger of lambda a times u of lambda a must be the identity operator. And this relationship means that the operator u is unitary. So in other words, we have a unitary representation. And I think then we, this is a good point to stop. Uh, in one word, a relativistic or Poincaré invariant quantum theory 
is a quantum theory on which we have defined a unitary representation of the Poincaré group. As simple as that. That is the condition for any relativistic quantum theory unitary representation of the Poincaré group. And then we can go to representation theory, generators, p mu, j mu, and derive consequences. And we will do that tomorrow. And then we can answer the question that I posed on one particle states as well. OK, so see you tomorrow.